Personal Finance PowerPoint Presentation. Social Security Disability Insurance, SSDI. Prepare to get financially fit by practicing personal finance. Insurance is part of our long-term risk mitigation strategy where we follow the adage of measure twice, cut once, putting a formal process in place, looking something like set the goals, develop a plan to reach them, put that plan in action, review the result, and repeat the process periodically. Most of this information can be found at Investopedia, Social Security Disability Insurance, SSDI, which you can find online. Take a look at the references, resources, continue your research from there. This is by Elise Bell, published. March 31st, 2022. In prior presentations, we've been looking at insurance in general, going to the medical insurance, and now we're thinking about the disability insurance, basically, and the different components of it, long-term disability, short-term disability, and the kinds of insurance that might be provided, say, through an employer, for example, and possibly by the government versus those kind of things that you might be providing on yourself so we can kind of think about the different components and how we can piece them together for, with our risk mitigation strategy. So now we're talking about the Social Security Disability Insurance, otherwise known as SSDI. What is it? Social Security Disability Insurance, SSDI, is a federal income benefits program that provides financial assistance to Americans with disabilities. So it's kind of like an insurance type of program but instead of us purchasing it uh, from a private company, this is a federal program, the SSDI. In general, according to the Social Security Administration, that's the SSA, benefits are paid to those who are not able to work for a year or longer as a result of a disability. So that's gonna be a type of disability insurance, of course. So, so this is, of course, part of the risk mitigation strategies. And remember, it's kind of in a similar uh, category as other types of insurance, like we think about the normal kinds of insurance, property insurance, we think of the liability insurance or life insurance, for example, we're trying to safeguard against something that we hope will not happen in the future. Oftentimes, the probability of it happening, hopefully being fairly low, but if it did happen, it would have a significant financial impact, such as our home burning down or us being sued for millions of dollars or us dying prematurely. And therefore, we're going to try to sh insure against that risk. When you're talking about the work, the uh, types of disability insurance kind of items now you're thinking about the workflow that you have and again you're hoping that you don't have any disability problems and you can continue to to depend on the salary that you're getting but uh, you want to be able to insure against that in some way that's the risk that we're trying to mitigate and we can think about the short-term kinds of insurance against that and if there's a long-term kind of disability a long-term disability is more akin to or close to what we might think about as like classic type of insurance where there might be a big financial catastrophe that could happen that we're trying to basically safeguard against hoping that it doesn't actually happen on the short-term kind of disability side of things if we have a short-term problem and a cut in our workflow hopefully we can self-insure against that at least to some degree by having savings sufficient to kind of self-insure against an issue like that hopefully so in any case here we go. Payments are provided monthly to those who qualify. So SSDI is an earned benefit, meaning that in order to qualify, you must have previously paid into the program and have accumulated enough credits to be eligible. Credits are dependent on work history. So this is going to be something as part of the whole uh, payroll kind of tax system that you would be eligible for because you're paying into the system. So if you haven't been paying into the system, then you, in general, the idea would be that you wouldn't have any SD, SSDI benefits in that instance. So if you had no work history and you hadn't been paying anything into it, then you might not have access to the SSDI. As SSDI is a type of disability insurance, eligibility is also based on the SSA's, Social Security Administration's, medical criteria and determined through an application process. Understanding Social Security Disability Insurance, SSDI. SSDI is a social security program for people who are unable to work due to disability. Now, when you're thinking about the social security program, remember, you think about it, it's, it's thought of or talked about on two ends of it. One, you paying into the system. The other, you getting some kind of benefits out of it. Normally, when we think about dis, uh, the social security, we're working, we're paying into it, either through wages being taken out of our paycheck, 
for payroll taxes, Social Security, Medicare, and so on, federal income taxes withheld, or we're self-employed and we're paying the self-employment tax and paying into the Social Security. Usually when we pay the money out, traditionally we think about that would happen at retirement where we might get the benefits at retirement, but now we're talking about the SSDI. That means the money, not, not us putting money in, we might get a benefit from it in the event that we need it for the SSDI, possibly get some benefits. So applicants must meet a strict definition of disability in order to qualify. So clearly, if you're going to qualify for this and it's a government program, then the question would be what has to be met in order to qualify. Their medical condition must be expected to last at least one year or result in death. SSDI is not for partial disability or short-term disability. So it's more of a long-term kind of safety net type of thing. SSDI is funded from employment ta income tax. So the taxes that we're paying in, contributions are calculated as a percentage of employment income and deducted from all employees' paychecks under the Federal Insurance Con uh, Contributions Act. That's FICA. So FICA, payroll taxes. Uh, in all jobs covered by Social Security or paid by self-employed people, so S Schedule C kind of businesses paying self-employment tax, on their net earnings under the Self-Employment Contributions Act. That's the SECA. As such, Qualification for SSDI is also based on work history and the amount received is based on lifetime average earnings in employment covered by Social Security. So now you're going to think about well, what's going to be the calculation for the payments. It's kind of confusing because I'm trying to be paying out based on it should be supplementing your income level, but it's also going to be based on how much you've paid in, into the social security, which will be influenced in part by your earnings level, because if you earn more, you will typically be paying more into the social security. So that can obviously get a little bit complex for the calculation. Applicants must have worked for a certain duration in job covered by social, sec by social security. The calculation is based on the number of calendar quarters worked and the age at which the disability began. Uh, recipients must also be U.S. citizens or have lawful alien status if they were not born in the United States. SSDI payments may be affected, likely reduced, if an individual or their family is also receiving other government benefits, such as public disability benefits, some pensions, or workers' compensation. So it's kind of like you can... The, and remember, these kind of programs like the SSDI and Social Security in general as well as like Medicare. When we first put them in place, it was kind of thought that these would be safety net type of programs. And this is important for our personal planning as well as, as, well as just how we're gonna vote or how we wanna think about these kind of things as a, as a country. Are these gonna be safety net programs? Are they kind of more welfare programs to help people uh, that, that kind of fall through the cracks and aren't able to, to, to uh, earn for themselves? Or are they something that's gonna be basically uh, for everyone. Is this, is this uh, a program that everybody participates in? So Social Security in general, more and more people expect to get to receive Social Security as part of their basically retirement planning as opposed to people that just need the Social Security because they weren't able to do the retirement planning. And, and so you have a similar thing with the SSDIs. It's something that we're going to, everybody can kind of depend on as a, as a kind of uh, insurance, more of a long-term kind of insurance kind of thing or is it more of a welfare kind of thing? And, and obviously that means it's gonna be dependent in part on other benefits that, uh, that you might be receiving as well. And one of the downsides of some of these kind of programs are that you, know, you, you wanna do well, you don't wanna to try to be aiming, you don't want a welfare program to force people to aim to not earn income because, because then they lose their benefits. And that's kind of one of the problems and the gives and takes when we look at these kind of programs and the incentives that they provide. So SSDI beneficiaries are also automatically enrolled in Medicare Parts A and B after two years of receiving benefits. We talked about Medicare in the past, so if you're in the disabled area, Medicare usually doesn't kick in until after a certain age, 65 I believe, but if you're disabled and you're getting the SSDI, then the Medicare uh, might, might uh, kick in as well. So whether or not SSDI benefits are taxable depends on your income. So, they, so then, of course, then the question is, well, I'm getting money. Is that a taxable event? 
and that might depend on basically your income level. If you're below a certain threshold, then it, it might not be taxable. So a history of SSDI. Social Security began in the 1930s as part of the Frank Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal reforms, but initially began only with a retirement benefits program with disability and medical coverage following in the 1950s and 60s. So a lot of these big government programs started at this time, the 1930s, when we, we had, of course, the Depression that was happening at that point in time, which was really bad. And then, of course, the, the, there was a war at the end. That, uh, and so there's arguments in terms of what kind of pulled us out of that downturn in the Great Depression. But in the meantime, the Franklin Roosevelt and the administration were trying to do anything just to do something, it seems like. So they made a whole lot of, of laws. Many of them didn't stick. Many economists uh, would argue that they were not helpful and possibly possibly harmful to the economy in many of the laws. But some of them, uh, you know, s stuck through. And some of the, you know, the big ones here, Social Security, obviously one of the big ones that are, are remnant from that time period. So then then they adjusted it for in the 1950s and 60s, of course, expanding it. In the 1950s, the Disability Insurance Trust Fund, the DI, was established to collect funds under the Federal Insurance Contributions Act, that's FICA, and Self-Employment Contributions Act, SECA, for the self-employed, for the Schedule C sole proprietors, for example, from which SSDI payments are made. Okay, so SSDI application process. The application process comprises the following general steps. So the applicant gathers the required documentation and information for the application. The SSA, Social Security Administration, that is, has a checklist on their website. So you can go to the Social Security Administration website, take a look at their checklist, and that can assist the process. The applicant completes and submits their application. The SSA reviews the application to ensure that the work and disability requirements are met. If there are any questions, the SSA, the Social Security Administration, will contact the applicant and request additional information or documentation. Documents, the application is processed and sent to the applicant's State Disability Determination Services Office and the state agency determines whether the application is successful. The applicant receives a letter in the mail regarding the decision. The decision can be appealed in writing within 60 days of receiving the decision. So if you want to say your decision is wrong, then you can appeal it possibly. So the SSA recommends applying for disability benefits as soon as you become disabled. This is especially important because if an SSDI application is approved, most beneficiaries, with the exception of those with ALS, must wait five months to receive their first payment. So remember, this is more kind of a long-term disability thing. So it's not really designed as so much to, to, to get the money out right away for the month to month. That's more of the workers' compensation is helping out with that. And if ho hopefully we have our own self-insurance to some degree to be able to survive a few payrolls without money, well, that would be ideal if we could. And then this would be the more the long-term kind of insurance that might uh, that might uh, uh, kick in. But that of course means that you wanna do the application process as soon as you think it might be something that, uh, you, would, that you would need it's because it'll take a while to process. It's a big company or big administration uh, type of process. As a result, the first payment would be made in the sixth full month after the date that the disability began according to the application. Qualifying for SSDI in general, in order to qualify for SSDI, you must meet the following criteria. You are unable to work and engage in substantial gainful activity, SGA, due to your medical situation. You are not able to conduct the type of work you did before, or you are not able to do any other type of work as a result of your disability. Your condition has had or is expected to have a duration of at least 12 months or to result in death. So uh, note that there are special considerations and slightly different eligibility criteria for people who are blind, widows or widowers of workers, children with disabilities and veterans. So in, in line with the above, the state agency makes its decision using these five questions, moving through them in consecutive order. So number one, are you working? If yes, and you, and you make an, on average, over a certain monthly figure in general, you will not be considered to have a disability. 
So obviously, if you're able to do the work, then you would think that you're not, you're not going to just be disabled. Now, this is one of the sad things about this kind of insurance. And we would like to not have these kind of bars over our head, limiting us from kind of working. And that's kind of what ends up happening with some of these with some of these programs, right? Because, you know, if you start making money over a certain level, then you would expect that you're going to lose the benefits, which you might be dependent on. And therefore, you're going to you're going to not, you know, try to work over a certain level and and so on. So that's just kind of one of the downsides to some of these social programs. So the amount uh, changes annually and is also referred to as substantial gainful uh, activity. That's the SGA. So if not, uh, or you make less than the SGA threshold, then the agency moves to evaluate step two. Uh, step two or number two is your medical condition. Is it severe under the SSA's definition to have a disability? Your ability to do basic work activities must be significantly limited for at least 12 months. These include walking, sitting, standing, lifting, and remembering. Uh, if not, uh, you won't be considered to have a disability. If your condition is considered severe under these criteria, the agency moves to evaluate step three. Number three, does your medical condition meet or medically equal a listing? The SSA uses a listing of medical conditions that has been created in consolidation with the medical experts. So they got to put you in a category or else they don't know what to do. You know how the government does that. They try to put everybody in some kind of category. That's you. We've defined you by this thing. Here we go. These conditions are considered severe enough to prevent someone from being able to carry out work activities. The state uses this list to determine if you have a disability by confirming if your condition meets or is equal in severity and duration to a listing and its criteria. If this is not the case, the state continues to step four of the evaluation. Number four, can you do the work you did before? This stage of the evaluation determines whether you are able to continue on with any of your past work given your medical situation. If your medical situation does not prevent this, the state will determine that you do not have a disability that qualifies for SSDI because the point is that you're, they're going to might get the benefit because you can't do the work. But if you can do the work, then then you could still earn money. So if your medical situation does interfere with the ability to carry out past work activities, the evaluation moves to step number five. Number five, can you do any other type of work? At the final stage of the evaluation, the state considers whether you are able to carry out other types of work based on age, education, past work experience, and skills. If they find you are able to do other work, you will not qualify for SSDI. If they find that you are not able to do other work, you will be considered to have a qualifying disability. SSDI payment schedules. Payments are made the month after for which... Payments are made the month after for which the benefits are due. For example, the benefit due for January 2022 would be paid in February 2022. Since June 1997, benefits are paid monthly on the second, third, and fourth Wednesday of the month, depending on the beneficiary's day of birth. So we got the first to 10th day of birth paid on second Wednesday of the month. If you're on the 11th to 20th day of birth, paid on the third Wednesday of the month and the 21st to the 30th day uh, for 31st day of birth, you're paid on the fourth Wednesday of the month. So if the Wednesday on which the payment is scheduled is a federal legal holiday, the payment will be made on the first preceding non-holiday day. So the day of birth used to determine the payment schedule is that of the person's person whose social security number is associated with the benefit program. If multiple people are receiving payments associated with a single claim, for instance, uh, in the case of dependents of insured people who are disabled, they will share the same payment day. So prior to June 1997, payments were provided on the third of each the third of each month. So beneficiaries of SSDI who receive payments at that point in time remain on the same payment schedule. Social uh, considerations. 
SSDI is a federal program offering benefits only for long-term disability under a strict list of defined medical conditions. Some states, namely California, Hawaii, New Jersey, New York, and Rhode Island, offer state-funded temporary benefits for short-term disability. So that would be dependent on the state. Remember, these are the two kind of components of the disability. Their eligibility guidelines and administration criteria differ by state. Many employers offer private disability insurance as part of the benefit package, usually through commercial insurance brokers. Uh, these also may allow coverage for partial disability, but may require a healthy valuation before initial sign-up that will usually lead to higher premiums or denial of coverage if a me medical condition is determined. So it is possible to benefit from SSDI while also insured under a private plan. However, receiving SSDI payments may reduce the monthly benefits from the private insurer. So now you've got talking about some overlap between other insurance and the SSDI. You would think that you, you can't really get you know, double, you would think that the double insurance might cause you, you know, a problem because you're getting double the benefit for the, for the one thing that's supposed to be covering the one, the one payroll. But it would be nice to have some coverage for the short term type of thing, at least until you get through the application process for the longer term insurance, if possible. So receiving private benefits uh, does not impact your qualification for a benefit amount from SSDI, however. Who is eligible for SSDI? Workers who are no longer able to work as a result of their disabil disabling medical condition. Eligibility is based on work history using a credits system and severity of disability. To qualify, you generally need to have worked in jobs covered by Social Security for at least five of the past 10 years or have 40 credits, 20 of which were earned in the last 10 years uh, ending the year your disability began. In some cases, usually with younger workers, applicants may be eligible with fewer credits. You also need to meet the definition of disability as outlined by Social Security. What's the difference between SSDI and SSI? Social Security Disability Insurance, SSDI and SSI Supplemental Security Income are both administered by the Social Security Administration, the SSA, but SSI provides monthly payments to people below a certain income and resource threshold and eligibility is not based on work history. People aged uh, 65 and older who do not have a disability are also eligible for SSI if they meet the financial criteria. SSI is, is, founded by, is funded by the general tax revenues rather than social security taxes. What are some changes to SSDI for 2022? For beneficiaries in 2022, the Social Security Administration, the SSA, announced a 5.9% cost of living adjustment, COLA, to all Social Security monthly payments, the biggest adjustment since 1982. The maximum SSDI benefit for 2022 is estimated at $1,358 per month to eligible individuals. For taxpayers, the maximum taxable earnings increased to $147,000 meaning that the Social Security tax remaining the same in 2022 as it was in 2021 at 6.2% is contributed from all income up to that amount. So in other words, when you're putting the money in to the Social Security, it gets capped out at that 147000 and then you don't pay your percent, the 62 percent above that amount and a lot of people ask well why would that be that means that if you get if you earn a whole lot of money you're not putting more money into the program and again it, it has to do with this idea of are we talking about something with social security that is a safety net program and that's supposed to be paying out for people that really need it or it looks like it's going more and more towards it's it's a benefit program that everybody basically gets access to meaning the more money that you put into it the more the more benefit you should get basically at retirement or when, whenever you need the payouts that are coming out of uh, the Social Security. And after your income goes above a certain threshold, you're no longer it's no longer adding to the calculation of kind of like your benefit calculation that you would have. That would be part of the rationale for that. In any case, the substantial gainful activity SGA amount for 2022 
uh, increased to $1,340 per month as compared to $1,310 per month in 2021 for non-blind beneficiaries and $2,260 per month for blind beneficiaries as compared to $2,190 per month in 2021.